I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Monroe County Board of Commissioners. It is uh, Wednesday, November 17th, 2021, and we'll begin with the um, our public statement read by Commissioner Giffins. We, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners, renew our commitment to welcome and protect the rights of all people, regardless of age, race, color, creed, disability, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, marital status, economic status, and national origin. And we affirm the right of every person to live peacefully and without fear. And we will fight and resist at every step discrimination and harmful policies, whatever their source. We also stand in support of our county public school systems, both RBB and MCCSC. Right. Thank you so much. I'll note for the record that all three commissioners are present. And we will now go to our department um, updates. And um, we should have, um, oh, looks like we don't have um, Penny Cottle here. Is that true? Oh, there she, there is. she is. Excellent. <laughs> We will turn to uh, Ms. Cottle for our um, update from health. Thank you. Thank you. Can't get rid of me, right? I hope not. <laughs> I, I was thinking maybe if we call your name anytime we need you, you'll just appear, you know? So, so there you go. Just kind of like a little genie, right? So I do come to you today a little bit disappointed, disappointed in our numbers and what, what we're seeing trend-wise with COVID-19. A few weeks ago, it looked like we were going to see some positive improvements and uh, drop in numbers on the COVID front. And here we are today, still in yellow. Um, the advisory level is still yellow. Our cases rose this week. They are similar to what they were a couple of weeks ago. Our daily case rate is running in the upper 20s. Um, today, I think it's 50. So, uh, you know, it. It varies a little bit from the weekends tend to drop because there's less testing. And then we do see at the beginning of the week, sometimes an increase because kind of catch up on those. Um, but what is probably some of the most disturbing to me is that this is the 17th of November and we have had over 11 deaths this month alone. At almost one a day. And while many of them are older, so some people say it's because people are older and they have underlying health conditions, we are seeing younger people pass. And if you look at the percentage of people who pass in different age groups, you will see that dropping. And that is very concerning. I don't want anyone to die. I don't care how old you are, but certainly um, we don't want to continue this trend. Uh, the board will meet uh, tomorrow. They have a regular scheduled meeting to um, deliberate about the current status and the current regulation um, and will make decisions tomorrow night about that. I encourage people to tune into that meeting, uh, provide public comment if they would like to do so. We know, and this has not changed, we, we have the tools to get out of this. And number one is vaccines. Indiana has vaccinated over 9,000 of our, our five to 11 year olds. That's not a high percentage, but you know we've just started uh, just getting at that. Um, most over half of those vaccinations have been done by the local health departments. Uh, certainly mass clinics and those are also part of the local health department, but they're kind of tracked differently. Providers are providing a large number of that as well. So far, pharmacies haven't really started getting into the uh, a lot of those numbers for the five to 11 year olds. And I think that that will continue to increase as we go forward. We do have a mobile clinic. We have tried uh, over time to use those mobile clinics and resources that the state has made available to us. Uh, we have a mobile clinic starting today, and that is here through Saturday. It will be on IU's campus, so we appreciate them partnering um, with us in the state. And it is at Smith Research Center parking lot. 
uh, that's at 2805 East 10th Street. And they will have all vaccines, including those for those five to 11. Uh, they will also be doing testing, both rapid and PCR testing. Uh, appointments are preferred and that site has been, been up for appointments, but they will also take walk-ins as they are avail able to do so and have enough vaccine for that. So that is today through Saturday, noon to 8 p.m. each day. The gravity test site is still open out on the west side of town at the old GE plant location. So it's Cook property, but it's now on that front side, the Curry Pipe side of things. Can be a little confusing to get in. So barriers right now, there's one lane in and out. So when you see the, you're there at the stop, um, I think it's at Jonathan and Curry Pike. Um, you'll see in front of that Cook property, some concrete barriers, um, but there's one lane. Use that lane to go in and out and be careful if there are two of you, be nice. Uh, follow the cones and you will come up to a building towards the back and on your right. If there is not someone out there at the time, then just put your car in park, wait for a moment and staff will come out to you. So this site is still a drive through, but it allows the staff to have the warmth of being inside when they are not taking care of people. So they, they'll have to see you pull up, they will come out and get you. Um, there's not a time. So just be that going into it. We did post a video on our Facebook page um, kind of showing you how to navigate that. So feel free to look in there and, and follow us on Facebook. They are open Tuesday through Saturday, 8 to 4 p.m. Uh, so please utilize that. That is just for testing, uh, just to make that very clear. That is just a testing site. We are starting our school clinics, and this week we have two mass open clinics uh, for our 5 to 11-year-olds. Uh, tomorrow evening, we will be out at Richland Bean Blossom Schools, and on Saturday, we will be at MCC. Uh, we'll be at the South School on Saturday. Those appointments filled up very, very quickly. Uh, demand is high, but we're pleased about that. But it does bring some time. We are working through those, continue to request state resources as we can and as they're needed. Uh, we continue to assess and change and adapt our hours at the Miller Drive Clinic. Um, so again, I've said this before, we need to be patient, uh, but we will get everybody vaccinated. If you have the resources to um, go out of town, Indianapolis Motor Speedway is still open. Um, other counties don't have the demand that we have. And so if you can find an appointment, um, all the appointments are on ourshot.in.gov. Go there, find what, what is near you, what works for your capacity, and make that appointment. Um, don't, don't feel that you have to stay here in town if you have the means to do something else. I know that if you don't have those means, we're still going to provide you and we will ensure. And I think that that is what I have for you today. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Cottle. We always appreciate all the information. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? It's just very disappointing to hear that our cases are going up again and about all that can be said is please get vaccinated. Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, I, I'm disappointed too. I need to remind folks too, to please get their flu shots because one of the things we can't have both COVID and flu overtaking our healthcare system. Um, people, people need to be able to have surgeries, other care when they need it. And that we're, we don't need to see that again. We can stop this. And, and thank you for saying that. That is something that I wanted to mention. We are seeing uh, influenza season look like pre-pandemic numbers. Um, and, you know, there, there's just no reason. So vaccine, 
Um, and all the prevention measures, the masks, hand washing, staying home with your sick, they, they all apply there as well. So please um, get all of your vaccinations that you need, follow the precautions, and we truly can get through this, but we have to do it together and everybody doing their part. Yeah, great advice. Thank you so much. We appreciate you and we'll see you in a few minutes okay, uh, for your agenda items. Thank you again. And um, next we have actually Ms. Ridge, I'm going to step on your toes a little bit and we're going to go to uh, Auditor Catherine Smith to talk about the remonstrance process. Sorry, Ms. Ridge, we'll be right back with you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I have a little frog in my throat, so bear with me. But I am fully vaccinated. Went, got my booster. Took my 80-year-old sister. Um, we went to Myers. It took five minutes. So I thought that was actually amazing. It took longer to wait uh, afterwards to make sure that you're okay. I was very, very pleased um, because I had the JJ shot, so I really was concerned. Uh, so thank you for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit about remonstrance. And basically what remonstrance is, is a process to officially petition the, um, to, to, officially petition saying I'm, I'm not interested in being annexed by the city. So this is only for certain cities or certain um, residents of our county that are in the seven areas that the mayor is interested in, um, in annexing into the city of Bloomington. So if you're in one of those areas, this information is, is primarily for you. So if you're interested in saying, I am not wanting to be part of the city. I like being part of the county. I like uh, the services that's, that's, that we have. I like the fire, I like the sheriff's department. I really like the roads, all this kind of stuff. I just really don't want to be in the city. Or if you're just like, I'm just not interested in paying higher taxes to be part of the city when I think it is equivalent um, the services, it doesn't make any sense to, to you, then you would probably want to get a petition and to remonstrate against the mayor's um, and the city council's request to annex your property. Now, if you're interested in being annexed into the city, you have to do absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing is a vote of confidence for the city saying, yes, I would like to be part of the city. Um, I like their services. But if you are on the opposite side and you don't want city services, you're okay with the county services, you love that, you want to stay part of the, the um, as a non-city resident, then I'm going to tell you how to do it. Okay, so there's two ways to do it. You can collect signatures as long as you live in the area and you collect signatures from the people who also live in your area, or you can just do it yourself. So if you just want to sign yourself, there's a very simple form. You just come in to the courthouse or you can um, call us if you'd like to. Um, and we can email you one, email you a, a piece out. You're going to sign right here. And you can also, um, you can also uh, uh, send us an email at annexation at co.monroe.in.us and we will send this form out to you to sign and it give you instructions on how to do it. Simple, painless. If you'd like to collect signatures, um, then, then we'd like you to, um, to come and speak with us in the courthouse, bottom floor, it takes about five minutes. We're going to give you a piece of paper that looks very similar to the other paper, but it's gonna have multiple sheets. Here's one that's been turned in already where someone has went out and collected signatures. Each set contains places for 25 signatures. So the, the, the own, only rules are you have to live in the area, um, you have not live, you have to own property. I'm sorry, that's my mistake. You have to own property in the area to be annexed. And you can only collect signatures from the people that, um, that also own property in the area to be annexed. So there's, a, there's um, some confusion, but uh, we've got a good team here. I'm Kathy, the auditor, Kathy Smith. Uh, my chief deputy is Chris Munch. She's amazing. He's uh, the project manager for this project. Then we have um, a young lady who's helping out downstairs to greet people. Uh, Danelle Uli, longtime resident, Garden Acre. She's in one of these areas to be annexed to. Uh, she was actually born in that house. She's my age, so she's been there a long time, her and her parents. Um, we also have uh, Patrick Ellis. Um, who uh, is doing all of our GIS work and helping. So we really have a very bipartisan effort. Um, we have two Democrats, two Republicans, and a small team. We're all working very closely together uh, in a bipartisan effort uh, to, to help 
all of our citizens, whether they want to be in the city or not be in the city in these proposed annexation areas. So you're welcome to call us. You can call me on my cell phone, 812-360-2338. Again, that's 812-360-2338. And I can walk you through it, or you can uh, email us at annexation at co.monroe.in.us. We are just sweet people. We want to help you. If you want to just sign yourself or if you want to take up signatures or if you just want to say, what's the difference? What would the difference of my taxes be? We can certainly ca quickly calculate that for you. We can tell you that over the phone. Um, this is not like a, you know, the old days of going to the license branch where you had to stand in line and it was painful process. You know, you walk in the door here at the courthouse, you're greeted by people with smiles on their faces. It's going to take us five minutes to help you. We're going to do everything we can uh, to help you, whether you for organization or not for organization if you have questions. So feel free to call me personally. You know, you guys elected me, the county elected me. I work for you. I work for everybody that's watching this that's a Monroe County resident. Um, that's uh, my personal cell phone. I'll be happy to help you. Now, if the commissioners have any questions, I'd be happy to address those questions. Great. Thank you, Auditor Smith. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, I'd just like to thank you for the very detailed information about remonstration. Um, and it's very good to hear that it can be done by email. I think a lot of people will find that to be quite a bit, bit more convenient for them. Commissioner Giffins? Oh, you're muted. How do you every time? Yeah, I'm a little bit worried about um, property owners who um, live outside of our county and making sure that they get notified about what needs to be done. Uh, do we have any mechanism for that? Uh, yes. Okay, so the city sent certified letters out to all property owners, and there are a there's a huge effort of people in the community that are reaching out to uh, people who live out of state. And when, when we identify someone who lives out of state, we work with them over the phone or over the email. Um, you know, we have addresses of like who paid their taxes last, where they're at. Uh, but mainly when they got their certified mailing, uh, most of them, I would say a large majority actually called in to get information about it. And we've taken care of, of a great majority of those already. Do, do we know how many of the certified uh, letters have come back to the city as not deliverable? Uh, the city hasn't given me that information. We have asked for that. And I will tell you that I live in area 1B. So why I have to be Switzerland on all the other areas, because I live in 1B and I'm not for an station for me personally. Um, I get to not be Switzerland for my area. And I did go down and sign up at the city myself at eight o'clock on the first day. I haven't received that back from the city. So we haven't received any, any information from them for people who they have signed up uh, for. But Jeff has, uh, our, my attorney, Jeff Cockrell, asked for that yesterday and they're going to be providing that. Um, but, uh, but so, so we are in communication with them every day. I think that they're just like us. They're very overwhelmed. It's a large project. If you could look around my office, it looks like a bomb went off on here in here because this is annexation central. Uh, this is, we're trying to keep everything in one room, do all the work here. I've got a separate desk set up uh, right in front of my desk. Um, we, we are working with their attorneys. When I went down to sign up there, uh, when I went down to sign up there because I wanted basically them to know the truth that I was going to sign up myself because I do live, I own two pieces of property in 1B. Um, then I that would hope, hopefully open lines of communication. And I do believe we've worked well together. It's just, we're all overwhelmed. It's a lot of work. We've had over uh, 1,400 petitions returned. Now that's return. That's not all the petitions that are out there. And so um, people have until just after the beginning of the year to return their petitions. We ask that they not wait that long so that we can, because we have to vet them. When I get the petitions in, whether it's a one person petition or a petition full of 25 signatures, I have five days and only five days to send those to the city. Once I've checked the property ownership, five days to send it to the city uh, so that they can present any waivers against those properties. Then the city has 15 days to return any waivers to me. And this box is full of what they've sent me. That's all they've sent me so far. And, um, and there is a list of, um, 
of uh, people who whose waivers were inactive and and um, and also valid waivers. So I'm basically dividing the waivers into two categories: valid and invalid. If the if the waivers are over 15 years, I'm following the state statute that says that they are invalid. Um, so so we have to look at. When was it recorded? When was it signed? Uh, who was the ownership of the property then? Because the person who has ownership of the property then may not ha still have ownership. I mean, 2017 was when all this started. So it's, I would not say it's an easy process. It's actually a very complicated, very detailed process. Some of these meets and bounds deeds have three pages of the Southwest, Northwest, one half, one quarter descriptions. I mean, can you imagine? And it's in chains and rods and all the old old measurements. Uh, so it so so it takes it, it's taking somebody brilliant like uh, Patrick Ellis because I am getting old now. Uh, in um, to, to redo all of this and to superimpose it on GIS to make sure that nothing is missed, that no ownership is, uh, but he is actually a genius when it's coming, when, and the GIS guy has helped us too. Amazing, amazing talent these young people have. Um, and so, uh, so we're working really hard to make sure that no one slips through the crack. And I think that's really what you're most concerned with, Miss Penny, is that, uh, that we don't leave somebody high and dry and they don't know about it and don't get the opportunity to get in here and, 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 and their wishes and their, um, their interest uh, be, be articulated and be processed accordingly uh, to the Indiana Code. And that's what we're trying to make sure. We're trying to make sure we don't alienate anybody, we don't forget anybody, we don't leave anyone out. So I hope that answers your question. If you have more, please just ask. Uh, answer. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Smith. Appreciate you being here today. Um, appreciate the information. And, and we turn to Ms. Ridge. Good morning. No Thanks problem. Good morning. Um, so uh, paving season is uh, is coming to an end. The the plant should be closing in the next couple of weeks. We finished Rock East Road yesterday, turned out very well. Um, I do want to say that there will be a road closing this Saturday. We do have it sent out to all the emergency services. Uh, the new profile parkway from Curry Pike to Gates Drive, we're actually just closing that on Saturday to apply a sealant. Um, this is a new product that we have been looking at. Um, and actually it's supposed to help the longevity of a new road. Um, for, to add on approximately six to seven years for the pavement. So uh, again, it's something new that we wanted to try on a new roadway. Um, so Saturday, that, that section of roadway, we'll have it barricaded off. And again, we sent out the proper notices for that. So um, other than that, we have our stormwater contractor workshop going on today over at Ivy Tech. That's going really well. So we get the developers, the engineers um, in attendance to follow new guidelines from IDEM. Um, and discuss the new ordinance that will be coming through um, in the county in the upcoming months. So um, we're still busy, but uh, that's all I have. And if you have any questions. All right, thank you so much. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, that's exciting about the sealant. Um, it'll be wonderful if it actually works out well. I take it you can't really use it on roads that have been repaired. It's actually a better sealant for things that have new pavement that's been in, uh, down in the last six months. We kind of ran into a little bit late in the season with the weather because it needs to be uh, roughly 50 degrees for it to, to dry. So we kind of hit this window for this Saturday to be sunny and uh, 50 degrees. So we're going to go ahead and, and apply it. And it's our first time of using it. So we want to make sure that we get the best product out there for uh, for the funds that we're spending on it, but we we think it'll help for the longevity, and we're excited to try some of these new processes that are out there to to help with the longevity of these roads. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Giffins. Now this is the new. Um, is it soybean or corn? I can't remember that. That also then helps local farmers because they have another outlet for their what they're uh, growing. So this is a different, a little bit different of what you, that we had discussed um, previously on our bridge decks. So we have been looking at the sealants and getting quotes and everything from that, um, including the ones that are um, soy made from the soybean. So that's something that we want to look forward to look at using our actually our bridge decks for longevity of those. 
Great. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Next, we have uh, um, Washington Township Trustee uh, Barb Uli. Good morning. Good morning. Had a little trouble getting onto Zoom this morning, so I was panicking. Um, <clears throat> I am um, here today just to request another disbursement into the Township COVID fund. Um, that fund actually right now is sitting at about $1,000 um, as of um, last month. Um, last month was a, a big month for Perry Township. Um, in terms of need. And so um, it is very low. Um, and so I'm hoping that that disbursement can be made so that uh, we can continue helping out the townships throughout the end of the year. Great. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uli. Um, uh, comments or questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, I'm just very pleased to hear that this is being successful, that, that you all are able to help so many people stay in their homes, avoid homelessness. Um, it's, it's been a great project and I'm proud that Monroe County has done it. I am as well. It, it, it's, it's proved that it, it was needed and that we really, as, as trustees, were able to get it, get funds exactly where they were needed to keep people in their houses um, because a lot of people it got I mean that we're, we're, we're talking multiple months of rent that the township's been paying over and above our normal um, state mandated criteria and so it really has kept a lot of people especially in the Perry and Bloomington and Richland areas it's kept them in their homes and, and it, it's given them a basis to continue to be able to help themselves as well. And I think that's the important thing is that we're enabling people to continue helping themselves. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, when I, when I saw your report, it was like, oh my gosh, hundreds of, of households have been able to stay in their, their residences and keep the utilities on too. It's not just that they're they're able to stay there they yeah. can keep the heat on in the winter yeah so. that's a great point um and um so uh would one of you be willing to make a motion to um um move this additional funding and cut the check for the township assistance fund do we need an amount for the check maybe twenty five thousand would be the next disbursement Yes, I'd like to move that we uh, get a $25,000 check into the township fund for relief of citizens in danger of second. homelessness. We have a motion and we have a second. Um, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Just raise your hand in the Zoom screen. Ms. Chavez is waiting to speak during public comment, please. Okay, thank you, excellent, all right. Uh, seeing none, um, uh, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the Township Assistance Fund request? Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Giffins? Yes. Motion is approved, three to zero. Excellent. Thank you so much. And we did receive your report as well. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your hard work. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, are there any other um, departments uh, that wish to offer an update for us this morning? Can you raise your hand in the Zoom screen? I don't see any. So with that, we will move on to our next item, which is public comment. This is public comment for items not on our agenda. Uh, comment time is limited to um, three minutes. Uh, we're gonna ask you to give us your name and whether or not you're a Monroe County resident. At two minutes and 30 seconds, you will hear a tone. Thank you so much, Ms. Dayton. When you hear that tone, uh, it means that you have 30 seconds to wrap up your comment. Um, so with that, um, we do have um, Ms. Chavez. Good morning. 
Good morning. Can you hear me? We sure can. All can right. Give your name, verify your name, and let us know if you're a Monroe County Cindy resident. Cindy Chavez. Yes, I am a Monroe County resident. And I run Pantry 279. We are also in Monroe County. Um, I'm coming today because I'm sh many of you may know, I hope you know, that we have the big Thanksgiving program distribution this weekend. Well, deliveries are on Thursday and then Friday and Saturday's distribution down at Monroe County Fairgrounds in the community building. Typically, we would do this from our place, but as you know, with COVID and everything, numbers have greatly grown. We don't have the space. Last year, Hoosier Hills loaned us their building. But once again, as we continue to grow, we don't have the space. <laughs> and so this year, we're at the fairgrounds. But unfortunately, we applied for several grants that help us to fund this Thanksgiving program, turkeys being the biggest bill. And we were declined this year for those programs. I mean, I'm sure they had wonderful places for that money to go. Unfortunately, this year, it was just not us. Um, my turkey bill is about $35,000 for what I have pre-ordered. I have some of that money. I'm still at about $18,000 short. And although I am absolutely not asking for $18,000, that's a heck of a lot of money. I am really thrilled to death. If you guys could give anything at all towards that bill, that would be a great help. Uh, we are cutting today the um, signups a little bit early just because we are at 2,000 families that have signed up and... Will I have 2,000 turkeys? Probably not, but I've got some hams and I've got Dave from Butcher's Block coming in with some chickens. So hopefully everybody will have some form of meat, but at least we have managed to scrounge together everything else on the Thanksgiving list. So they are definitely going home with a decent sized box of food, judging on the size of their family. There you go. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate all of the um, hard work um, at Pantry 279. Um, and uh, I'm sure we can um, look at this and try to figure something out um, as we do have, I believe we have some funding remaining um, for uh, food assistance. So uh, hopefully we can do that. Um, next we have uh, Nick Voiles. If you could verify your name and let us know if you're a Monroe County resident. My name is Nicholas Boyles and I am a Monroe County resident. Thank you. Can I begin? Okay. Please. Uh, my name is Nicholas Boyles and I am the executive director at the Indiana Recovery Alliance. Please bear with me. This is the first time I've done anything like this and it's kind of a happy moment for me. Uh, the IRA is part of a collaborative effort that recently extended legislation allowing SSPs to operate in Indiana. We also played a large role in the developing Indiana's ZIP HIV HCV elimination plan, particularly around the involvement of people with lived experience and increased access to harm reduction statewide. Uh, we are most excited about the development of a leadership academy we're working on to educate people who use drugs about HCV, MOUAD, or MAT, and their rights as they navigate medical systems. In short, on the individual level, we want people to be able to spot the hypocrisy and doublespeak when they encounter it and know how to fight back to get their needs met. On a state level, we hope for statewide coordinated informed community of people who use drugs that advocate and educate about policies and legislation that impacts them. The IRA is uh, something of a uh, 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 close to the heart for me. You know, I'm a Monroe County resident. I have lived experience in just about every area. I've been through the carceral system. I've been through the uh, chaotic drug use and found myself in a place where I could give back. And uh, it has transformed me in a way that is absolutely unable to comprehend into words. I watch this program make changes in people every single day. Uh, just up to date from January to today, we have 2,077 reversed overdose episodes reported. That is a lot considering we are dealing with 96,000 people that have died just in 2020 from the overdose crisis we are in. Indiana is number one in acute new cases of HCV. We are battling a war here. Um, I'm here to uh, for uh, support of renewing the contract and extending the SSP. I hope you guys feel the same as I do. Uh, we have three people here who can give comment or not. I don't know how this works. Okay. Uh, 
This is, this is um, thank you so much for being here. This is an agenda item and this is for general public comment for items not on our agenda. So can we um, have uh, those folks hold on because that's coming up very soon on our agenda, this item? Ab absolutely, thank you okay. very much. Thank you, we appreciate it. Okay. All right, I don't see anyone else offering uh, public comment. Um, so with that, we will move on to our next agenda item, please. Move approval of the minutes for November 10th, 2021. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any edits, comments, corrections? No. Nope. I had one correction and it's already been taken care of. I checked this morning and it's up on the website. So that's great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on approval minutes um, for November 10th, 2021. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Excellent. Uh, next item, please. Move approval of the claims docket, accounts payable November 17th, 2021, and payroll November 19th, 2021. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Um, um, Mr. Jordan, would you, uh, Jordan Miller, will you tell us all about it, please? Of course. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the total for claims was $849,078.80. Uh, there were two uh, items in that claims docket that um, consisted of over 50%. So I'll touch on those two. Um, the first of those was E&B paving in the amount of $258,077.49, um, which was for, I believe, approximately $61,000 worth of black top um, surface intermediate 12.5 and 9.5 learned a lot about that this morning um, and then there was another 196,000 uh, for the contractual <laughs> paving of the Karst Greenway um, and then in addition to that $205,662.73 was for M. Dode LLC uh, for tax sale surplus redemption and interest as far as payroll is concerned the total for that was $1,624,900.02, uh, 70.5% or $1,146,068.07 were for the direct costs of the main supplemental and incentives payrolls and the remaining 29.5% um, or $478,831.95 for or for uh, the payroll related claims consisting primarily of taxes and retirement. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Miller. Um, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? No, I don't. Commissioner Giffins? I saw one item on the claims that surprised me that we're still paying some long distance charges. I mean, they're small compared to everything else we pay, but um, that, that just surprised me. I, yeah, yeah I, I feel like every time I get uh, these extensive uh, claim docket packets, I, I do find something interesting. As I was mentioning, I learned a lot more about the differences in, in, uh, uh, in surface, uh, blacktop surface this time around. So I completely agree. You never know what you'll find in these packets. And uh, it's just quite a number of items. So very interesting. Uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Raise your hand on the Zoom screen. Seeing none, uh, Mr. Cocker, we please call the roll on approval of the claim stock at accounts payable November 17th and payroll November 19th. Commissioner Thomas. Commissioner yes. Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Thank you so much. Hey, right. thank you, Mr. Miller. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I will note for the record that we have received a report from the treasurer and that report is for October, 2021. And with that, um, we will um, uh, go on to new business. And the first thing on the agenda in new business is um, I'm going to go ahead and open um, a public hearing regarding the syringe service program renewal. 
Um, and it looks like Ms. Cottle is here to tell us a little bit about it. Good morning. Thank you. We're um, pleased to be able to bring this back before you. You know, in 2015, we received our first approval and for a syringe service program in Monroe County, and it started in February of 2016. The process for these approvals has changed over that time. Uh, in 2015, it was very extensive and the state health commissioner had to approve it. And there was a very, very long process. In the last few years, it has streamlined quite a bit. So we are bringing this to you to request a two-year renewal, which is allowed by law. And it, should you approve it, and I hope that you will, then we will get, help you gather all the information that then goes to the state health department and the state health commissioner and will notify Dr. Box of the approval and the extension for the program. So I wanna share just some reasons why we're doing this. You have the letter from Dr. Sharp or health officer. Um, it's since 2015, um, where we declared an epidemic for hepatitis C um, and the program has been providing harm reduction services to those most at risk in our community. During our initial application period, local hepatitis C cases were over 50% higher than in similar case numbers reported in 2009. In 2018, the percentage more than doubled and case reports were 105% higher than that in 2009. The data today shows that the hepatitis C epidemic in Monroe County is still in effect. Uh, lots of efforts are going into this, and I believe that if we didn't have all of the various people working on this and the programs in place that we have in our community, our numbers and the data would be much higher than it is. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, people who use injects are at high risk of both acquiring HIV, acquiring viral hepatitis, and other blood-borne sexually transmitted infections. Injection drug use is now the most common means of transmission for hepatitis, and specifically hepatitis C, making a syringe service program medically appropriate for a comprehensive public health response. The Monroe County Board of Health, the Health Department, and the Health Officer would like to formally request that Monroe County Commissioners approve a renewal of the Monroe County Syringe Service Program for a two-year period. The goal of the program is to prevent disease transmission and harm reduction and reduce harm by providing safe materials, harm reduction education, referrals to services, including treatment. Uh, and then just to kind of go over what the program is and is not, the Monroe County Syringe Service Program helps to prevent overdose deaths by providing naloxone, a medication used to reverse opioid overdoses, teaching people who inject drugs how to recognize, respond, and reverse a drug overdose. In 2020, the program provided over 19,000 individual doses of naloxone. And with the increase in um, the potency, the fentanyl and things, sometimes it takes multiple naloxone doses to bring that reversal about. And every reversal, I just wanna say, is a life saved. We talked about deaths with COVID and now we're talking about potential deaths uh, from overdose. And we wanna prevent each and every one of those. Along with the Monroe County program, the health department's home harm reduction program provides education. We provide HIV and HCV testing. The program strives to increase, increase sharps disposal options throughout the community, as well as responds to improperly disposed of syringes. The health department partners with many other people in our community. The Monroe County Substance Use and Mental Health Community uh, Health Improvement Team, our Zero is Possible Coalition, our Substance Use Disorder Advisory Commission, Monroe County Cares, we have a Naloxone Grant Program, and we're part of the Stride Coalition as well. 
even with all, all that's being done, there still needs to be more done in order to meet this comprehensive need. Uh, problems caused by drug addiction are complex. They require complex solutions. There is no quick fix. It requires all of us working together to have true impact. We know that uh, these programs save lives and that people who use syringe service programs are five times more likely to enter into some type of treatment. So making a true impact does take time. We've been at this a while. We know it's gonna take time. We request the commissioners approve this renewal. And when you, hopefully you will approve it shortly. After that, we do intend to renew our contract with Indiana Recovery Alliance. Great, thank you so much. Um, so let's go ahead and open this up to public comment for the public hearing uh, regarding a syringe service program renewal. Um, and we, we've um, heard from uh, uh, Nicholas Boyles um, and he had indicated there were some other folks as well. So if those uh, people who are on the, uh, the call of the meeting today can raise their hands, that would be great. Uh, we'll start with uh, Jim Shelton. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Jim Shelton speaking as a CASA this morning. Uh, I told you guys a couple weeks ago about a case that was going to be ended. Uh, in fact, it was ended three weeks ago with reunification with the parents with their little four and a half year old boy. That mom would have been dead were it not for this program. She overdosed. Uh, it took, I believe, either four or five injections to save her. She had, she was lucky that she overdosed in the parking lot at Centerstone. So there was somebody there who knew what to do and could do it immediately. This program, uh, it does save lives. This lady has uh, been drug free now for over two years. As I said, has been reunited with her son and uh, would not have been possible with, without this. So I strongly urge you to approve this. It is uh, very benefits. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Nicholas Voiles, good morning again. You are muted. There you go. There are people, we, we all joined together on one computer, so there's other people here. I'll try to have them. Oh, great. Make sure we get their names, please. My name is Kylie Kimbrough, and I've been a I've been a volunteer at Indiana Recovery Alliance for uh, about three years. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I just wanted to say that I really hope that you guys approve for our renewal because this place means a lot to me. I have actually, it saved my life. I've uh, OD'd some time ago. And then since then, uh, I was saved by the services, the, the Narcan that came from here. And now I volunteer here and I help uh, do Narcan trainings. I get um, H H HIV and hepatitis treatment to people on a regular basis. Every time I do a shift, I'm referring people to services that I know like we're impacting so much change in the lives of people in Bloomington. And I just really hope we can keep doing that. And it would mean so much to me to be able to keep doing that. Thank, Thank you. Hi. You. Uh, my name is Whitney Meeks. Um, I'm a Monroe County resident. I have been volunteering with uh, Indiana Recovery Alliance since 2015. Um, I have um, been uh, saved um, with naloxone myself twice because of this program. Um, I'm currently uh, in another treatment program. Uh, I do consider myself sober um, at the moment. Um, and I just want to say uh, how deeply uh, I feel about Indiana Recovery Alliance. Um, it I have seen it change lives. Um, I definitely support Mick 100%. Um, he's been a, a great uh, benefit to Indiana Recovery Alliance. And um, as a volunteer, uh, 
you know, I see, I see people and it's like looking in the mirror for me. And um, it's a very uh, spiritual experience to, to have that, you know? Um, and I just, I just want to end with, uh, I hope uh, we all support for another year. Um, this has uh, saved so many lives and other, other uh, accesses uh, to other programs as well. Um, so thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you. Thank you for the courage of speaking up and we appreciate your words. Hi, can you hear me? Sure can. All right, my name is Julie Pemberton and I'm a new staff member here at Indiana Recovery Alliance. I am assisting the Director of Development. Um, I am new to the IRA, but not new to substance use. Um, it has impacted my life in many ways. Um, as a working in healthcare for years, um, I saw how it affected workers, and and I, one on one of my first outreach shifts here, um, a participant came in, and one of the things that are asked with our participants is, have they used naloxone since the last time they have been here, or if they're brand new, have they recently used it, um, and was it a successful? use or oh, I'm sorry yeah yeah um was it successful or you know what what was the result and um the person said yes it was successful and then I you know that the tears welled up and you know things like that are so important to this community and reducing the stigma having all options available for people who use drugs to have to maintain their lives so that they can be, you know, productive members of society and, and live healthy lives. So the resources that Bloomington has to offer, I think the IRA is, is in, in the top by all means. And I hopefully um, hope you guys see that the way that we see it. And we really appreciate Nick as the new executive director and we are excited to, to, to grow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last one. Sorry. There is three of them. I'm sorry. Okay. So that, that's that the end of the comments. Yeah, I'm please. sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you for second. that. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate that. Let's see if there's anyone else that wishes to offer comment on this item for the public hearing. I don't see um, any other hands raised. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and ask uh, Commissioner Jones if she would go ahead and make a motion, please. Move to approve Indiana Recovery Alliance syringe service program operations. Fund name, health, fund number 1159 in the amount of up to $20,000. Is that the correct thing, or are we making a motion on extending the syringe service program? They are uh, two separate items. Okay, so um, move approval of the extension of the syringe service program. Renewal. Second. <laughs> okay. We have a motion and we have a second. Um, I will uh, go ahead and take comments from my colleagues at this time on um, the syringe service program. Um, Commissioner Jones. Yeah, this is such an important program for our community. It's really disappointing to hear that the cases of hepatitis have still been going up, but it could have been so much worse without this program. And this is a very difficult time for lots of people. So 
probably more people are suffering from these problems than usual. Commissioner Gibbons? Yeah, um, I, there are so many reasons that I, that I support this. Um, we're one of only nine counties in Indiana um, that have a syringe services program. I got online and was checking yesterday to see if those, that number was still, still true. And, and I actually wish that we had that syringe possession were not illegal in Indiana um, the way it is now. Uh, I think something like we had almost double the overdose deaths last year that we had from the previous year, which um, some of those could be some of those people could have been saved with proper administration of naloxone. I carry naloxone in, in my vehicle uh, in case I came across anybody. Um, I just finished reading Canary in the Coal Mine by Dr. William Cook, who um, is the physician who was really made a difference in um, Austin, Indiana, down in Scott County. And one of the things that he cites in there is a quote from a fellow from a minister and he said, why do you teach people how to clean syringes? And the person, the minister said, because if I keep the person alive, perhaps I can work with them and save them in other ways. And I think that that's part of what the syringe service program does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I fully and, support this program. Yeah, And it was uh, amazing to hear from folks uh, connected with uh, Indiana Recovery Alliance, uh, amazing people telling very courageous stories. Uh, we really appreciate them coming on and sharing um, um, what they know and um, what they've seen uh, with the public because it's important to, to get those stories out there. And I will just note, I think that um, Dr. Sharp wrote a really great letter of support. And one of the things he um, noted is that these syringe programs work um, quote, they prevent disease, they save lives, and people who use them are five times more likely to enter treatment. So, I mean, that right there is reason enough, but, but the human interest side of this, it's so important that we, we save as many people in our community as we can. So, all right. So with that, um, uh, let's see. See, uh, Mr. Cockrell, we please call the roll on uh, a two-year renewal of the syringe service program. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved. Three zero. Excellent. Really happy to do that. Very good. All right. Now for the next item. Move to approve Indiana Recovery Alliance syringe service program operations. Fund name, health, fund number 1159 in an amount of up to $20,000. Second. We have a motion and we have a second, Ms. Yes, Cuddle. thank you for that approval to extend our syringe service program in Monroe County. Um, our internal health department harm reduction program is a great partnership. There, there's kind of these pieces. We do a lot of the naloxone training, um, education. We look for other grants, but we also directly work with Indiana Recovery Alliance, who we have from the beginning had this contract with in order to provide direct service. So Indiana Recovery Alliance provides the operations for the syringe service program. Uh, internally, we do testing, HIV and hepatitis testing, as do they. Together, we do naloxone dis distribution. Uh, this particular amount that's listed here in the health fund, the up to $20,000, is from the health fund budget. So the, the Board of Health has set aside that $20,000 to support the program. They have certain deliverables that they meet. We go through quarterly, and they are paid on a quarterly basis. Also in your packet, you saw other ways that we support and provide um, things, uh, supplies and what have you to the program that all together total about $100,000. So the, the cash to the program is smaller, uh, but our harm reduction program does have supplies that go to them. Um, we get funding usually Every year we have received funding from the Greater Health Foundation of Indianapolis, 
think that I got that in the right order. Um, I, I, their name always um, eludes me a little bit. Uh, we have a program with naloxone from the state, uh, those kinds of things. So every opportunity that we have um, to be sort of that indirect provider of resources to the program uh, that IRA manages for us, we do that. And uh, if it were without an agency like Indiana Recovery Alliance, it's very, very difficult. Right now it operates seven days a week. There's some services uh, provided kind of in-house storefront, some that are mobile um, with uh, going out to different places and those vary from day to day. But without this partnership, we wouldn't be able to have that kind of reach. Um, so, you know, again, there are lots of different pieces to this, helping people, meeting people where they are, helping them find the resources that they need, whether it's food, housing, some clothing, um, education, whether it's treatment, whether it's other medical care that they need, uh, whether it's naloxone, um, whether it, whatever it is, um, it is there to try to build that rapport and get people the services that they need so that they can have a healthier life. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Nation, uh, it's just really videos? good to hear that the IRA and the health department are able to work together so close effectively with this very important program. Um, and I hope it can continue well into the future. Commissioner Giffen? Yeah, I also want to applaud the work that your staff does independent of this. I've, I've been out and watched um, some of what they do and the inter interventions, the uh, portable sharps disposals, the information about where to get services, uh, even taking snacks and, and socks down to people. Um, so they really are meeting them where they are. And um, it's a community effort. And you do it well. Yeah, That's and I and great job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they do amazing staff, and I appreciate that you noted the um, significance of the supplies that are provided as well as this money, because this money looks pretty small, this amount. But um, in addition to supplies, it's really a great support. So thank you for for clarifying that. Um, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. We have um, Ashley Craner, who I know is a Monroe County resident. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just from um, the position of being the vice chair of the Monroe County Health Department, just wanted to extend um, a thank you to all three of you commissioners for continuously supporting this really important program and um, and supporting the funding for it. You guys have always uh, been champions for the SSP and the IRA. And of course, um, you know, supporting Penny and all the work she does. So just wanted to say thank you and um, much appreciate. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see if there's another item. Uh, yes, uh, Nicholas Boyles. Yeah, I'll be really brief. I know you guys heard it up for me. Uh, one of the key things that our partnership with the health department gives us is the staff. There is no way we could do this without Melanie, Kathy, Penny, all the people that support us. It is truly, uh, as we moved into me coming into being the executive director here, one of the thing me and, things me and Mel and, and the whole health department decided is we really wanted to cement that partnership and show what that really looks like, both to here in the county and when we go out to other public places nationally. You know, I'm on a lot of national boards and we hear a lot of bad things about relationships. We have a great relationship. Maybe it's a how-to for people. Maybe it's a show, you know, a way to meld the ways, you know? But I just wanted to really highlight the fact that without those staff and without the people that make all of the money and the supplies and all these things go, it's not worth anything. Those relationships are really how we build and move forward. So I just want to give a brief comment and make sure that Melanie and Kathy, uh, who you know, get 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 a some consideration and you as well, Penny, all of you guys for for making this what we are. Right. 
Thank you for that. All right, um, it looks like we don't have any other uh, public comments. So uh, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the Indiana Recovery Alliance Syringe Service Program Operations? Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next item, please. Move to approve health net renewal, fund name, local health maintenance, fund number 11 state, in the amount of second. All right, we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, please tell us all about it, Ms. Yes, Hall. we have had this uh, agreement with what was Volunteers in Medicine, right, and CHAPS Clinic before that uh, to provide prenatal care for those who don't have uh, other means. And so we, as they became health, then transitioned to health next a little bit, uh, this could provide additional assistance to women with their prenatal care uh, that is outside of Medicare. Medicaid um, often doesn't pay for the delivery fees and those kinds of things. So uh, there are pieces of Medicaid, even cracks, not everybody has health insurance coverage. Um, so this is our way of trying to ensure that people have healthy pregnancy, so they have a healthy delivery, and we can reduce our infant mortality and maternal mortality in our county. Excellent. And it uses local health maintenance dollars, which is from the tobacco settlement money. Great. Thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? It's wonderful that we have them here in this county. I was just seeing earlier this morning that many counties in Indiana have no prenatal services at all. And that unfortunately much more frequently leads to death or injury from pregnancies. Yeah. Comments, questions, Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, I, I really support this. We have something like three times the maternal mortality and infant mortality of other states uh, and double the uh, mortality of surrounding states. Um, we are just way down on the totem pole. We've got to reverse that. Um, lives depend on it. And so again, you're out there fighting for lives. So thank you. All right. This is a great program and um, uh, maternal mortality for African-American women is high across the United States, um, not just here in Indiana. So that's another important part of um, tackling this problem. So uh, appreciate all the hard work. Uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Seeing none, um, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the Health Net Agreement Renewal? Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved, three to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next item, please. Move to approve an MOU regarding Child Advocates, Inc., fund names, County General and JDAI Programming, fund numbers 1,000 and 9145, in the amount of $7,500. Second. We have a motion and we have a second and we have Christine McAfee here. Good morning. Hello all, good morning to you as well. Um, I am excited again to share that we have found funding and obviously continue to support bringing this important workshop to our community. We are looking for April of 2022, but because we're able to get this MOU signed before the first of the year, we will not incur whatever cost increase they will likely um, bring the beginning of 2020. So we're eager to get it signed, get it on everybody's calendars. As you all know, people, people's lives get really busy and April feels like it's a ways away, but we know we wanna get this on calendars sooner rather than later. So. Um, it will be a joint venture between courts, excuse me, courts and JDAI. We are working very hard to ensure that all court employees from bailiffs to court reporters, probation staff, support staff, and with the support of YSB, 
We anticipate we will have extra seats as we always have. And we'll of course reach out to the community and offer this workshop at no cost to uh, community members, stakeholders, and the good folks of Monroe County. Great, thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, I know we've done this before and uh, I've heard really good things about it. Unfortunately, April is a month when my business doesn't really allow me to attend a two-day conference, but I hope that someday it'll work out so that I can. Commissioner Gibbons? Yes, I've, I've already spoken a couple of different times in favor of this program, having gone through it. And um, I, I, I'm appreciative of the fact that it's not just our, our court system, our judicial people that go through this. I really appreciate the fact that CASA volunteers and others are able to go through this. I think that makes a difference uh, across the board. Yeah, this is a great program and it's wonderful that you open this up to other residents uh, when you have seats available. I think that's an amazing thing to do and it only helps the community. So great work. Uh, let's see if there's any uh, public comment on this item. Seeing none, um, Mr. Cocker, will you please call the roll on the MOU regarding Child Advocate Inc. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Okay. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye. You too. Uh, next item, please. Move to approve the stop grant agreement amendment. Fund name, stop grant, fund number 8123 in the amount of $100,643.13. Second. We have a motion and we have a second and we have uh, Beth Hamlin here from the prosecutor's office. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Um, this is a request for approval and signature of the grant agreement. I made an error when I uh, sent this over. This is not a grant agreement amendment. This is a new grant agreement for our stop grant. It's a, a contract with Indiana Institute. The funding covers dates 10-1 of 2021 to 9-30 of 2022. The stop grant funds 50% of the salary FICA and PERF for a sex crime deputy prosecuting attorney and a domestic violence deputy prosecuting attorney. These two prosecutors in conjunction with the sex crimes and domestic violence victim assistance and a part-time investigative assistant make up the special victims unit within the Monroe County Prosecutor's Office. The goal of the SVU is to more efficiently focus resources, training and staff on crimes of violence against women. Uh, this is a renewal of the, a grant agreement, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, this is really a, a very good program to have the, the um, victim assistance and just all everyone who makes up this uh, special victims unit are doing things that have needed to be done for a long time. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Giffins? I just wanna thank Ms. Hamlin and the people in the prosecutor's office for getting these kinds of grants. It does make a difference again in our community. Yeah, it's really, really important work. Um, and this has been ongoing for a number of years and a, um, a very successful program and uh, clearly uh, something that's needed in our community, sadly, but I'm glad that uh, the program is there um, and is so well funded. So appreciate that uh, hard work uh, to continue to get that funding. Let's see if there's any uh, public comment on this item. Just raise your hand on the Zoom screen. Seeing none, uh, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the stop grant agreement renewal? Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, please. 
Move to approve an MOU regarding IPAC funding for a regional high tech crimes unit. Fund name to be decided, fund number to be decided in the amount of $285,000. Second. We have a motion and we have a second and we have Prosecutor Erica Oliphant joining us. Good morning. And I'm actually gonna get started. Um, and before I'm, I'm gonna introduce Erica, I just wanna get a little bit of the housekeeping details out of the way. As this said, that the fund number is not known at this time. I am working with Sarah Malone and I will be bringing to you an ordinance to develop a fund um, and that'll come to you this year because the prosecutor's office has proactively worked with IPAC to secure another grant for $285,000 to develop a high tech crime unit that will serve Monroe County and 10 other counties. So it's a regional unit. Um, you'll have, today you have this MOU, which Erica can give you a few more details about. Um, and the IPAC wants it signed by November 19th. So this is an MOU that IPAC developed and um, hopefully you'll approve it today so that we can keep this ball moving forward. I will then bring you an ordinance to approve to create a fund so that when the money comes to us in January, it can be deposited in this non-reverting fund. And then in, again, in the future, we'll come back to you with an agreement between uh, Monroe County and IU because uh, the prosecutor's office is gonna work with IU in the development of this um, high tech crime unit. So. I will be back uh, a couple more times, probably with the prosecutor's office. This is a really exciting, great project spearheaded by the prosecutor and she can tell you a little bit more about it. Excellent, thank you. Uh, prosecutor Olafa. Thank you, thanks so much Margie for all of your help with this. Um, it's, a, it's a big project and I wanted to make sure I was doing it right. So I'm glad to have her expertise here. I am respectfully requesting that you sign the memorandum of agreement prepared by the Indiana Prosecuting Attorneys Council so that I can uh, work with Indiana University to create a valuable resource for the Monroe County justice system. House Enrolled Act 1082 added Indiana Code 33-39-8-7, which allows the Pro Indiana Prosecuting Attorneys Council or IPAC to establish high tech crime units to assist prosecuting attorneys in investigating, collecting evidence, and prosecuting high-tech crimes. A high-tech crime is defined as a crime committed with or assisted by digital network or communications technology. So what makes a high-tech crime is not necessarily the type of crime, but rather the type of evidence um, that would be involved. In July, I submitted a proposal to establish a regional high-tech crime unit here in Monroe County in partnership with Indiana University Bloomington. IPAC notified me on November 4th that my proposal had been accepted and Monroe County will start one of the 10 regional high-tech crime units. Uh, IPAC is granting my office $285,000 a year to establish, administer, and maintain a high-tech crime unit. The grant allows for us to hire and train staff, to purchase hardware and software, and to meet other necessary expenses of the unit. Uh, one important thing is that no matching funds are required by Monroe County. Um, Indiana University is expected to contribute to the high tech crime unit um, with things such as office space, equipment, and staff. The high tech crime unit uh, will act as a crime laboratory for the collection, storage, and analysis of digital forensic evidence. So evidence from devices such as cell phones, tablets, computers, GPS devices, and even fitness trackers uh, that can be so helpful in criminal investigations. Uh, the same week that IPAC informed me that my proposal was selected, I was in a murder trial um, where I introduced digital evidence from the defendant's cell phone. Um, this evidence helped me to establish the timeline of the crime and also provided evidence of the defendant's knowledge of guilt of this crime. Um, I have cell phone evidence in another homicide case that includes photographs of the crime being committed, an application that was used during the commission of the crime, as well as text messages about the crime. Uh, I received that evidence with assistance from the Indiana State Police Cybercrimes Unit, um, but that unit uh, 
is responsible for evidence all over the state and has been inundated. So the idea of establishing these regional units is that we will have a faster turnaround for digital ev evidence processing. Um, unlike DNA evidence, which is circumstantial evidence that someone was at a place or handled an object, digital evidence can also give us a window into when, why, or how a crime took place. Um, it's important to note that sometimes this evidence, much like DNA, can also be used to exonerate the innocent. Um, so now that my proposal has been accepted, I've been working to get everything in place. Again, I want to thank Ms. Rice for helping me with uh, my subcontracting process with the university, as well as fund creation and some of the county government requirements. Um, today, I'm going to go look at the space that we're intending to use on IU campus the superintendent for public safety, uh, Ben Hunter, as well as police chief, Jill Lees. Um, as Ms. Rice said, IPAC would like to have the signed memorandum of agreement by this Friday. Um, and I'm attending a meeting uh, with other high tech crime unit prosecutors who've been selected as well as IPAC on December 5th um, to receive some further guidance on this matter. Uh, the funding will become available on January 1st, and so I'm trying to get everything in place to try to get us up and running and operational as soon as possible in 2022. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, comments, questions? Commissioner Jones? Yes. Um, I'm curious about ex exactly how you will interact with the other counties that are in the region. Um, might be something that's been worked out yet. Yeah, it's still a work in progress, but the idea is that we would have a, a crime laboratory. And so these other counties would bring us digital evidence that they need processed. We, they would have to show us proof that we can legally search that item. So according to the constitution, we have to have either a, a search warrant to search or um, some other justification for a search of that item. So they would have to document um, what the item is, where it was, where it came from, and what justification we have to get into that device for a search. Um, we would process that item and then turn over the, the end product of that search to that, that agency. And then they would, their prosecutor would, would have that evidence for their cases. Um, when you say processing the evidence, is does that just mean looking at what's on the cell phone or is there something more complex? Yeah, so there's forensic hardware and software that's used to um, get into people's devices and, um, you know, put it in a readable form so that um, you or I could understand <laughs> what that data means and what it, what it is. Um, so there is, there is hardware and software needs to pull stuff off of the phone. It's not, you're not just like holding the device and looking at it. You're actually sort of making an image of it that you can oh. work with um, law enforcement. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, comments, questions, Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, between the last item and this, I expect to hear the doink doink from Law and Order on television. You know, with with moving into different different areas. But um, you know, one of the things that that we were hearing about earlier this year was from Eric Evans and sort of email scams and things like that. Will this unit also be able to look into um, people being scammed, either our phones or their? Sure, computers? that's a type of evidence that we can get. I think one of the most challenging hurdles though in a lot of those cases is that the person who's actually perpetrating those scams is not in our jurisdiction, even in our country. And they use a lot of um, different methods to hide their IP address and to otherwise obfuscate where they are and who they are. And so those, those are very challenging cases, but to the extent that we can chase it down, um, we, we can process the equipment of victims of those scams to try to to try to hunt those folks down. Thank you. Uh, this is amazing. I'm so grateful that you were able to uh, get this grant. Um, a lot of hard work that goes into that, you and your staff, and I uh, can't thank you enough. I think this is going to make a real difference in our community and, uh, and across uh, 10 counties. So excellent work on this. Uh, let's see if there's any uh, public comment. 
raise your hand on the Zoom screen. I don't see any. So with that, uh, Mr. Kapo, will you please call the roll on the MOU regarding IPAC funding for a regional high-tech crimes unit? Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Githens. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Next item, please. Move to approve ordinance 2021-43 to amend zoning ordinance chapter 801 and 807. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Um, we have um, uh, the planning director, Larry Wilson here. Uh, Dave Schilling is also on this call. I imagine if we have questions as well. Um, um, uh, good Wilson. morning. Uh, I'm here in regard to ordinance number 2021-43, an ordinance to amend uh, chapter 801 and chapter 807 of the Monroe County Zoning Ordinance in regard to signs. Uh, you approved this ordinance on November 3rd, 2021. At that meeting, uh, Commissioner Githens noted a uh, an error in numbering. We reviewed the uh, ordinance that had been submitted to the commissioners uh, for that meeting and found a couple of other errors in uh, numbers and pagination. And so we are bringing it back today generally for ratification of the corrected version. Uh, in substance, the ordinance is the same. It is the ordinance precisely that was certified by the plan commission to the commissioners. Uh, we just wanna make sure that there's no question because of uh, the litigation that's in this area that we took it back for approval of the typographical changes that were made since the uh, November 3rd, 2021 meeting. So really just seeking ratification of the revised corrected. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, comments, questions? Commissioner Jones? No, I don't. Commissioner Giffins? Um, yeah, I, I think that there's still um, an error in numbering on two different pages. On pages 116 and 176 of our packet, they've taken out um, item three for 807-6D, they've taken out item three, so they should renumber four and five. Can we just get this on the screen, please? This is not something that we can follow with, with page numbers. Sorry. I'd assume that that was number three on page 116, that that renumbering was going to happen. Well, the, yeah, the, the, since they took three out, then they should renumber number four and number five and the same on page 176. Yeah, that's, I'm, I make that assumption because that's what I see when I look at these packets. Um, I'm not sure that that's significant. I, it clearly, it needs to be addressed. I'm just not sure that it's significant enough to delay moving forward here. Can, um, can we approve it contention upon making those corrections? Those are Scrivener's errors. Yeah, um, yeah yes, those yes. are those are Scrivener's areas, errors. And we'll make that change as prior to your signature. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, there are things in here that I would have numbered differently, but I'm not. Um, one, 76, um, that is 807-6D, as in dog, yeah. um, needs to be renumbered. Um, um, there's another. Yeah, I think that works. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see if there's um, uh, Mr. Schilling. Did you have anything you wanted to add since you put your camera on? 
I, I have nothing to add. I don't, I don't think there's any problem with correcting Scrivener's errors that we find uh, over the course of time. We just correct those. Uh, but other than that, no. Yeah, all right. Uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Okay, seeing none, um, doing three things at once here, doing none of them well. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on ordinance 2021-43? Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Giffins? Yes. Motion is approved, <clears throat> three to zero. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, next item, please. Move to approve a drainage easement Agreement and temporary construction assess easement for Carmola Drive expansion. Second. We have a motion and a second, uh, Mr. Schilling. Thank you very much. Dave Schilling from the legal department. Uh, these two uh, easements uh, stem from the rezoning approval the commissioners granted to Blackwell contractors on November 3rd of this year. And as part of that uh, application for a rezone, uh, Blackwell contractors uh, entered into a written commitment to offer two easements to the county. Uh, during the uh, presentation to the plan commission of the rezoning uh, petition, uh, County Highway Engineer Paul Satterley noted that we needed to have a drainage easement uh, for a culvert installation and instruction on the southeast corner of the rezone property. And it was noted that uh, the county is in the process of upgrading Carmola Drive. And I think uh, Lisa informed me that it's about 60, that project is about 60% through the design phase. So that's a, a road project the county is going to be uh, funding in the next couple of years. And so uh, the uh, the petitioner, Blackwell Contractors, agreed to grant the county two easements to address those, those concerns. So the drainage easement uh, relates to the culvert installation and maintenance. And the only uh, action we need to take on that is uh, just to accept the, uh, the, the agreement, the easement uh, dedication. There's no need for signature on that, just a motion to accept that. Uh, the temporary construction access easement uh, you will need to sign if you approve it. And uh, that covers uh, the portions or the, the need to get onto uh, the property that, that was rezoned uh, for the purposes of construction. We're gonna be, the, the road uh, improvements will be done within the existing right of way, but we'll need to get on that property to, to install those improvements. And uh, so the granting of this easement will save the county money uh, in the future when it gets to the acquisition phase. And Lisa has informed me that it may be a year or two before this project gets underway. And I would note that the temporary construction easement uh, will expire on December 31st, 2024, or uh, when the grantee completes the agreement, uh, whichever shall first occur. So I think I think we're in good good shape there uh, for getting that done. All right. Thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones. Yeah, I've been hearing a bit about drainage problems concerning Carmola Drive from some citizens, and I I think it's a different part of it. But I hope that this project is going to help out a lot of those people who have been dealing with some drainage problems. Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, I'm glad that we're getting ahead of this. Yeah. All right, um, appreciate the work uh, that went into putting this agreement together. Uh, let's see if there's any public comments. Seeing none, uh, Mr. Popper, will you please call the roll on the drainage easement agreement and temporary construction access easement for Carmola Drive expansion. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. 
Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Next item, please. Move to approve Beam Longs to Neff Inc. for Baby Creek Bridge number 629, fund name Cumulative Bridge, fund number 1135, in the amount of $360,000. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Uh, Ms. Ridge, thanks for sticking around. Uh, tell us all about it, please. Good morning again. Um, so the agreement is for design services for the bridge 629 on Baby Creek Road. The construction for the bridge uh, is um, funded for fiscal year 2026. Um, it is a federally funded project with 80% being from federal dollars and 20% being from local funds. Um, this was awarded last spring for the fiscal year of 2026 NOFA call with NDOT. Um, so this is just moving forward. We went in to negotiate. We did RFPs uh, to select a consultant. Um, those are scored. Uh, the process is sent to NDOT for their approval. And then we entered to uh, contract negotiations um, to come to this contract for design services. Excellent, thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? This is another um, problem that I've been hearing about from citizens. And I think a lot of people will be very relieved to see it moving along. Commissioner Githin? Yeah, it's, it, it's amazing, again, that you're looking at construction that's five years out at this point. Yeah, and it's, it's planning. It's good, yeah, it's always good to get a get to get moving on it because sometimes an entity around the state will not either have the funds to complete a project or if um, uh, POs and they're not having action on their pro projects, then they get closed out. That frees up that extra money. So if we can get to design and right away and have it ready, then there's always that chance that, you know, they might come to us in fiscal year 2025 and say, if you're ready, then we can move it up a year. So kudos. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. All right, um, it's going to be good to get this work done. Um, the storm water has been looking at, at this area for a long time. Uh, it will be very nice, uh, so good work. Um, all right, uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Just raise your hand on the Zoom screen. Seeing none, uh, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the longest and Neff uh, Inc. agreement uh, for Baby Creek Bridge number 629. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, we don't have any appointments today. Um, just a few announcements, just a reminder that we are accepting applications for all boards and commissions. Uh, so please go to co.monroe.in.us and um, uh, find what interests you and fill out an application, very easy to do. Um, and we appreciate all of the residents who give uh, their time and experience um, to uh, assist Monroe County and help us get become even better. Um, I will note as well that for um, residents who would like to receive updates on everything from health orders uh, to uh, travel road conditions to uh, severe weather to please uh, sign up for a resident alert, go to co.monroe.in.us and click on the megaphone. You can choose any number of ways to uh, receive the information, uh, text, phone call and or email. Um, and um, also, uh, as we saw this morning, um, we still have a township assistance fund um, that is still um, going strong. And uh, so for residents in our community who need assistance, please contact your township trustee as soon as possible. Contact names and, and phone numbers and emails for um, all of our township trustees appears in our minutes um, every week. Thank you, Ms. Freeman, for that. And, um, and no matter where you live in the county, city, town, or neither, you have a township trustee. So please contact your township trustee as soon as possible if you need assistance. Um, this could be rent, it could be utilities, it could be other 
um, necessary expenses. Um, a reminder as well to for those who uh, residents who are, are targeted for annexation, if you wish to remonstrate, please go to the north door of the Monroe County Courthouse Monday through Friday, eight to four, um, and uh, get the information you need and sign um, the petition if you wish. Um, the auditor's office has been very helpful and the desk is right inside the door. Um, on the north side of the courthouse so you don't have to uh, traverse around uh, the courthouse um, to find it. Um, also note that we do have office hours um, uh, and these office hours um, are time for our constituents to contact us about anything um, that's concerning them um, and uh, to talk through issues or ideas. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. Just go to co.monroe.in.us and look at the calendar um, and you will find a, uh, six different time periods, uh, six different days um, of the month where you can uh, contact one of us directly um, and work with us via Zoom. And we're excited to offer this to all of our residents in Monroe County. Um, and with that, do my colleagues have anything else they wish to add? No. Okay. I, have, I have one thing. Um, one of the things that we heard from Pantry 279 was that they could use money, but they also don't even have enough turkeys and hams. And so they're asking um, local folks if you have the ability to pick up an extra turkey or two and deliver it to them, they will accept deliveries at the fairgrounds tomorrow, Friday, or Saturday. Um, and if you want to help in other ways, you can get onto their website at www.pantry279.org to make a difference in the lives of local residents. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Hopefully I'll be able to get out there this weekend and help out a little bit. It's always a good thing to do. All right. Um, and so with that, um, uh, we're going to uh, have our work session um, and uh, we're going to talk about the um, Pantry 279 request um, at our work session. So um, can we come back at um, 11.55? Does that work for everyone? Five minutes to noon? Is that good? Okay, excellent. So uh, this meeting is adjourned. Please get vaccinated and we will see you at 11.55 for our work session. Thanks everyone. <laughs>